Today is the official opening day for 2012 Asian Social Entrepreneur Summit that will take place at the Juan Rivera Hotel and I will be talking to many interesting people including Dr. Alex Nichols who is an expert within the field of social entrepreneurship from the UK. I'm Julie Tran and this is Bon Voyage on Make Change TV sending from South Korea. Welcome. Pleasure to be here with Dr. Alex Nichols from the UK. Thank you so much for taking Delighted. time. Delighted. For this interview. Yes. Many of our viewers are actually not familiar with the term of social entrepreneurship. So can you please give me a short uh, description of about course. that? Yes. Well, it's um, broadly speaking innovative uh, models to address big social and environmental problems. Yes. I think the additional point that we tend to put on it is that social entrepreneurs are very focused on their performance. So not only are they concerned about a social mission and will they be interested in being creative and innovative in their approach, but they'll also be driven to, um, to always do better, to yes. try to, to, um, to provide solutions that are more effective than what's gone before uh, and to try to sort of better the effectiveness of their projects going forward. So really performance driven in the way that sort of commercial entrepreneurs tend to be when they compete in markets. So this kind of performance piece is really significant as well as the sort of social innovation piece. Um, so I suppose that sounds a bit abstract really. So sort of concrete examples, the most famous would be things like microfinance, where you have, um, you know, the innovation really was to understand that the poor were not a high risk. I mean, conventional finance assumed that you couldn't lend money to the poor because they were sort of um, idle or lazy or couldn't manage their money. And really what uh, Mohammed Yunus and Grameen demonstrated when they began microfinance was that you could indeed trust the poor m better than you could trust the middle classes to repay. Yes. And so you had a real innovation around um, you know, a finance model. And then subsequently, Grameen Bank and the Grameen organization has kind of had this relentless performance focus to do better, to do its job more effectively, to help more people. So it's that mix of kind of social mission, help the poor, innovation, inventing microfinance and the microfinance models, and then this performance uh, driven approach yes. to, to constantly do more and do better. Yeah. So now you mentioned the word innovation, and that is a huge area in itself. Yes. So for example, for the case of an NGO opens a shop to sell right. second-hand things, is this social entrepreneurship? Right. Well, I think there are different degrees of innovation is the first point. So I think you, in, in, within social enterprise, you certainly do get innovation that's just at the product and service level. Um, so you know, a new widget, a new foot pump for irrigation in Africa or whatever it might be. But you also see sort of higher levels of innovation very commonly. So innovation, for example, at the market level. So you know, reshaping a market to uh, to address a social problem. So that would be fair trade would be an example of that, where you've created a whole new market for ethical consumption, for example. Um, and then you have an even higher level, which is the kind of political change. So some social entrepreneurs are focused on totally changing sort of political systems in order to, um, to bring about social justice or whatever. So the first thing to say is you get different levels of innovation. But to answer your question, I mean, can the simple level be social entrepreneurship? I think it can if it satisfies the other conditions I mentioned earlier. So this kind of performance-driven market orientation um, uh, characteristic, um, as well as the social focus. Um, and that isn't always there, actually. Mm -hmm. So many, so I think that that is why this is such an important qualifying condition, because there is obviously lots of examples of 
kind of socially focused organizations that have some innovation. Mm. Are they all social entrepreneurship? No, they're not, because I don't think many of them, or there are many that are not performance driven yeah. in the way that social entrepreneurs really are. Yeah. So they do a good job, but they kind of a charity or an NGO or not for profit that sort of ticks over every so often a new product or service, but they're not really um, demonstrating this kind of desire to yeah. really improve. And there are ways you can spot that. For example, how do they measure their performance? So a simple way would be to go and say to an organization, how do you measure your performance? How do you know you're making a difference? How do you know that you're doing better this year than you did last year? Yeah. And frankly, if, if they can't answer that question convincingly, they don't have a market orientation and they're not social entrepreneurship for me. This can be difficult to measure social mm. impact. So what's your view on that? Well, my view is it doesn't matter if it's difficult or not. If you go and do it, then you're failing. I don't okay. think there's any excuse <laughs> not to do it because yeah. I don't think anybody has the right to, uh, to claim that they're a social organization making a difference if they can't prove it. So, um, so it is difficult, you're quite right, um, but I think you have to demonstrate you're trying. Uh, and I think there's everything from very local kind of organizational based ways of doing this where you just talk to your, the people you work with and ask them something about are you making a difference? Are you helping them? What could you do better? So you just have structures that let you give, uh, give voice, if you like, to the people you work with. Yeah. And at the other extreme, there are kind of very formal methods, something called social return on investment, and there are sort of um, you know, more mathematical models that you could use, but you don't have to. Yeah. I think the important thing is you show you're trying to do something to measure your performance and that you do it consistently. Yeah. Uh, and the, the sad truth is, Many, many socially focused organizations, many charities, many NGOs, many not-for-profits just don't do this. Yeah. And you know, I think that's extremely worrying. Yeah, I think so too. So now come back a little bit. You're from the UK and it's really one of the leading countries when it comes to social entrepreneurship. So can you share with me shortly about what is the current status now? How, for example, mm. how many social enterprises do you have? And, <laughs> this, is a really, this is a very difficult question. It depends. There have been five major surveys of social enterprises in Britain done in the last eight years, and they will tell you anything between 15,000 and 232,000 social okay. enterprises. <laughs> so you know, it that. depends on how you measure it yeah. That's, or how you define, define it, really. A social enterprise. So yeah. the truth is there is no agreed figure. It's somewhere between those two. Um, within England, we have a a particular legal form that was developed in 2005 for social enterprises called the Community Interest Company. There were about six and a half thousand of those have been registered so far in six or seven years. So we know it's, it's some figure yes. probably in the hundreds of thousands or at least a hundred thousand plus, but it's very hard to put the exact figure, not least because some people include cooperatives, some people exclude cooperatives. So it's difficult to tell is the answer. Yeah. I think what we can say is that um, one of the reasons the UK has sort of stands out is because of the amount of policy interest in this. So for more than 10 years, you, the UK government has invested money and effort and, and policy innovation around growing the social enterprise sort of market, if you will. Um, and so that's something you can measure. You can see how much money has been spent. You can see how many uh, social enterprises have got investment from government. You can see how many social enterprises contract with government to deliver services. So there's some, some measures there that you can sort of point to. Um, but exact numbers, yeah. very difficult. Yeah. When I talk to different social entrepreneurs, many of them mention that finance is really one of their biggest challenge. Yes. Yes. Do you agree on that? Totally, yeah. I mean, you know, social enterprises are no different from any other enterprise. They need money to start up, to grow, to scale, to be successful. They need capital. Yeah. So they're no different from any other organizations. Yeah. The problem is, because they're social enterprises, they maybe don't fit a conventional investment model. Mm. So they don't sit in conventional markets. They don't generate conventional profits. The value they create is, is going to be as much social and environmental and human as it will be economic. Mm. So in order to understand their, you know, what is an attractive investment in the social economy, you have to 
account for all the value they create, not just a narrow financial measure. So I think what we're seeing is the, the emergence of a kind of new landscape of investment to support social enterprises, which um, bring together different sorts of investors in different deals, different new instruments for investing in social investments. Um, in Britain, we've, in, in, in April, just a couple of months ago, the, we, we, we announced a new project called Big Society Capital. Okay. So this is a 600 to 700 million pound um, social investment wholesale bank. Oh. So designed to invest in other funds. So it's not a direct investor in oh, okay. social enterprises, but it's designed to grow the bigger landscape of investors in social enterprises. Mm. And it should leverage about two, maybe two or three billion pounds of well, new investment yeah. into social enterprises in the next five to 10 years. So we're seeing models like that that are very innovative. And I think other countries around the world may copy that model if it's successful. So, um, so it's a big challenge, but I think we are seeing a lot of uh, innovation in building a kind of social investment mm. landscape or market. Yeah. Um, certainly in the UK and in parts of Europe, and I think also in Asia too. But there's a structural problem in the way that the fair trade movement that has the, the certi certification, because remember, not all of fair trade is certified, but the part of it that has the label, the way that part of the funding for that is pushed down to the producer is fundamentally problematic for the reasons you've just said. Yeah. So, so I wouldn't necessarily defend that model. I think we need, the movement should look for, for a different financial model because it is problematic for yeah. producers. So that's one set of issues. I think maybe we should look at a different business model for fair trade label. Yeah. Um, the other, of course, is there's a whole universe of fair trade organizations that are not part of the so-called flow system, the fair trade labeling system, that belong to the World Fair Trade Organization, the WFTO. And so they still conform to fair trade standards, but they don't buy into the labeling system. Yeah. And so consequently, they avoid the costs of the labeling system. Yeah. So, um, so an organization, I'm on the board of an organization called People Tree, yeah. which is a fair trade clothing company. Oh, I love that um, company. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. I can't claim any great credit for the designs, but, um, yeah. but I'm on the board. Um, you know, so People Tree is largely in the WFTO side of the fair trade yeah. world. And so, broadly speaking, they don't have to deal with the costs of the label apart from um, fair trade certified cotton. Yeah. So, um, so I think there's the, the two things there. So I think the problem is a real problem. I think there's one set of issues about rethinking the business model for flow, uh, but there's always an alternative that you just don't um, buy into the label and that you maybe use WFTO yeah. as your network. To, uh, to support you as a producer organization. Yeah. So what is the future for social entrepreneurship? Because Wonderful, I'll... obviously, <laughs> bright. No, because I want to see uh, integration, meaning understand that now we, we feel like, okay, social entrepreneurship has its own sector and it's developing very fast. Right. But then you, you also see you know, a, a huge number of, of traditional companies now, big of course, now also begin going to social innovation and they also develop yeah. products that address in market failure or social problems. So will there be a time where the kind of emerging with each other that there will be no separation between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in general? Well, I suppose that's possible. I think we're a long way away from that. I think the big discussion, you know, globally now is kind of what will a sort of new capitalism look like? So I think, you know, people accept that from, you know, in 2008, we realized that there was a model of capitalism that we had been running with for probably 100 years, which was bust. And therefore, where do we go from there? And part of that answer will be, I think, a set of social innovation, social enterprise solutions and models. Um, within market capitalism, but also within um, government structures. Uh, so I think how far we see social enterprise being a sort of parallel model, set of models to the mainstream, or how far we see integration, possibly even capture, possibly transformation, you know, those are the big questions. I'm not sure we, we know yet which, how that'll work. But I think what's plain to see is that 
in some ways, the biggest impact of social enterprise has not been what they do themselves, but it's been on the kind of things you're describing, how they're changing corporate practices, government practices, um, into, um, into looking more like social enterprises. But in the end, you know, what social enterprises have always done most effectively is address the areas of provision of services and goods where nobody else wants to go, the market failures. Yep. Now, those mar you know, market failures will always be with us, sadly. So given that it's probably the case, I think all, what we'll see is that if, you know, if, a, if a big corporate begins to behave more socially responsibly or begins to develop some of its products and services to address the poor, and so the kind of need for social enterprises disappears, well, they'll just crop up somewhere else because there'll always be need. Yeah. There'll always be problems we have to address in the world. Mm. So I think, it, so I don't think social enterprises will disappear. I think they might just say, you know, our work is done there. You know, once all coffee the world over is fair trade, there's no need for a fair trade coffee mark. There's no yeah. need because everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. So fair trade can do something else. Yeah. Now that we are in Asia, uh, one of your points from your presentation is that Asia can lead the way mm. within the field of social entrepreneurship. Yeah. How? Well, I think it already is, really. I think, I think the amount of innovation at the social enterprise level that we've seen in Asia outstrips anything anywhere else already. Um, may be driven mostly by India, is the truth. I mean, there's been a long tradition of social innovation in India, but also elsewhere across Asia, too. So I think, you know, it's already there. The kind of the Asian entrepreneurial spirit combined with the, you know, very substantial social environmental problems that we see in Asia kind of have already created a sort of crucible of activity that's, that's been around for some time. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, this, the 21st century and beyond is the Asian century. You know, we had a European century in the 19th century, we had an American century in the 20th century. The global economy is moving east, it's moved east. So I think the focus on the future development of the world across many different dimensions is going to be Asian, um, if only because of the economic power of Asia going forward mm. as the West declines. So I think the combination of this kind of entrepreneurial culture, some tradition of social enterprise already in Asia, and the next hundred years being about Asia in terms of the global economy, and perhaps Africa too, it could well be the African century as well, um, means that these are going to be the areas where we're, we'll, look, we'll look to for leadership and innovation. Um, and all you can hope is that Asia and maybe Africa do a better job than US and Europe did, because we pretty much messed up the model okay. of development <laughs> that we, we pursued over the last 200 years. The hope is that Asia will have a more sensible model going forward. Yeah. So are we moving to Asia now? I mean, make Chains TV move into Asia now and you will be I would moving love to, to the weather. Asia? The weather is a lot better here than in I London, know, I can tell especially you. especially in that I'd rather, be, you know, I'd rather be somewhere where it's 30 degrees every day than where it's like 18 degrees. So exactly. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for this interview. I mean, it's Thank great. You. You're from the UK, I'm from Denmark, and we're doing this interview in South Korea. It's, uh, a, it's a globalized summit. world. I know. Yes, it's yes. so great. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you for taking much. your time. Thank you.